Today we're talking about adult baptism and the theology of baptism. Last time we talked about the uh, practices, the canons, and the meaning and nature of sacraments. Uh, but we were just looking, here we go, at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where St. Paul talks about being baptized into the sea and the cloud and being baptized into Moses. So his understanding of, of baptism is this entrance into this covenant with God through the officiant, in this case, Moses. But now we are entering into something that is the fulfillment of what was happening in the Red Sea and in the Exodus. The fulfillment of that is the baptism into Christ, uh, because what the fathers were entering into was actually Christ. It was actually uh, the Logos of God, the second person of the Trinity. He was just yet to be fully revealed in his incarnation through Christ. St. Gregory Palamas, who is a, a very important Orthodox saint, you'll hear about him in a few weeks on the second Sunday of Great Lent, uh, explained this by saying, all these things were figures of our holy sacraments. The sea foreshadowed the water of baptism, the cloud, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit mysteriously overshadowing the people being baptized, the food and drink, Christ's body and blood. So next time you meet, Next uh, Saturday will be chrismation, and then two weeks after that, we'll start looking at uh, the Holy Eucharist as well. So we're going to look today, uh, and we're going to cover some of the ways in which baptism fulfills these Old Testament images. That's not going to be the main gist or main thrust of our class today. If you are interested in kind of really getting into some of the fun stuff in terms of Old Testament theology and baptism, uh, I highly recommend the recent Lord of Spirits podcast episode on, um, on baptism that they did and one of their early ones on the series of sacraments. It's probably about a month ago or a month and a half ago. St. Ignatius of Antioch, you might remember him. I think we looked at him last time. This early second century, what we call an apostolic father. In his epistle to the Ephesians, wrote, for our God, Jesus Christ, was according to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb by Mary, the seed of David, but by the Holy Ghost. He was born and baptized, that by his passion he might purify the water. Now, this is a weird thing to say. Uh, <laughs> if, if your understanding of his passion is like in a very narrow kind of understanding of a Western atonement theory, but if you understand what Christ is doing is setting aright the entire creation itself and putting back the elements into the proper order so that they can serve the purpose of God. The idea that the waters themselves are being purified when Christ is baptized, and, and that's part of his passion. Note that, that he says he's, that he was born and baptized, that by his passion he might purify the water that being even born for the early church, the passion is not just the few hours that he suffered on the cross. The passion really encompasses his entire life on earth, that he came, he suffered the, the kind of the, the humility of being born as a human being in a, in a stable and laid in a manger and being baptized by John who said, you know, I, you should be baptizing me. How can I baptize you? You know, that he came and humbled himself in all this way to set aright everything. And so for, for the early church, there was a clear understanding that water itself, in order to become the efficacious vessel for our salvation through baptism, itself needed to be changed. And if you look in traditional um, icons of um, theophany of the Lord's baptism, uh, you will see here not only the angelic choirs attending and watching this, this great and holy mystery, but down here there's these two little weird figures in a lot of these icons. And uh, occasionally you will see them actually have names attached to them, which helps explain the whole meaning. And th that is um, Yam and Nahar. You all know who Yam and Nahar are, I assume, right? Yam and, <laughs> Yam and Nahar means a river and the sea. And, but they're also the names of basically Canaanite gods. So the idea was that Christ was taking back the sea 
and the waters of the earth from the fallen angelic powers that had infested it. So then there's actually in the Psalms this verse about crushing the heads of the enemies in the waters, and that's referenced in the baptismal service. It's one of the kind of weirder things that I say when I'm, you know, that you came down and crushed the heads of the invisible ones lurking therein. You know, people are like, what? What's, what? Why is there all this exorcism stuff and baptisms? Because the recognition that Christ is coming in to reclaim the world, not just the person, but the entire world from the dominion and the oppression and the pollution of the demonic powers. And so uh, from the earliest times, this was understood that there was something going on here in this whole process. Okay. Of course, the words of institution, we'll talk about that with each sacrament. Um, that's, that's a kind of a particular phrasing of it that's used in the, in more in the West than it is in the East, you know, that, that a sacrament has to have words of institution. Um, really those are after the fact kind of thing considerations in the east because it's kind of like these are things the church was doing they didn't sit around read the scriptures and say hey the scripture says i can do this so now i'm going to do it it was the church was doing it and they explained it by saying well yes of course it's part of the ministry of the church that we received from the apostles and here's them referencing it it's not so much that it was like the text is the textbook that says here's the order of operations because uh, a lot of people are always like, where in the Bible does it do this or do that? You know, that's a very modern thing to ask. That's not the way the early church actually addressed these situations. They were doing the things that Christ enjoined them to do. For example, in this, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Christ says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They were already baptizing people well before all of this. But now here was, a, here was some kind of a change. They're being commanded to go teach all nations, baptize them specifically in the name of the Holy Trinity, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's called the Great Commission. And yeah. Just going to say to Jonathan, just enter the waiting room. Oh, yeah, thank you. Father, would you say then, uh, as a general observation that practice precedes scripture and also even precedes doctrine that the doing of these things uh precedes uh our reading about them in the scripture simply chronologically and our explaining them in, in doctrine well doc yeah to a certain extent, yes. It's not that there was no belief in them or some kind of idea about them. But when you say doctrine, specifically, I take that as a form, form, formalized expression of, of, of the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that definitely what we see is that the practice is in place and over time, doctrine develops as a way to teach what's being done, to explain what's being done. And you see this in the catechetical uh, lectures of the of the early centuries. For example, you have Saint Cyril uh, of uh, Jerusalem's lecture on the Christian sacraments. It's very interesting how he approaches it because if you read it, he actually begins uh, from it saying, "Okay, this is what happened to you. Yes. These are the words we used. This is the words that we use." So it's actually just the catechism was kind of an after the fact type of thing in this term in these lectures that he's giving this explanation after they already have been received. We're doing it ahead of when a person is received, but you see that this is, yeah, that's a good example of that. Would you, I'm trying to think of how to formulate this question, would you say, so practices themselves come from the apostles, but then the apostles themselves write the gospels. Yeah. So it's them kind of recording towards the end of passing those practices down. Yeah. Well, the, their experiences with yeah. Christ directly, but then also yeah. uh, maybe giving some like narrative context to the sure. practices they're doing. A big part of it is, you know, without going into a where did the Bible come right. from rabbit hole, you know, is that the reason that the gospels are written as late as they are is because it's that at that point that the, the, uh, the original apostles are starting to be martyred and they need that record. It's kind of like when you realize, you know, your 
your grandparents are getting old and you're like, we need to sit down and actually get some of this down in writing before you pass. Because up until then, it was very much word of mouth. And of course, through the epistles of St. Paul, which precede the scripture, you know? So, yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's part of that. I don't, I don't want it to be like a big thing about which came first, the chicken or the egg, because obviously you have to have, if the egg came first, you still had to have a very much chicken like thing to lay the egg. So it's not, it's, 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 it can, it can become kind of a false dichotomy that I don't want you to get trapped into. But the point being that as the church develops this, these expressions, the liturgical life does develop. And I'm not going to try to tell you that everything we do is exactly the same way it was, it was done in the first century. That would be not realistic. Uh, but, but the kind of the worldview and the meaning should be, there should be a connection there, right? You should be able to track that and find that and show that the basic stuff is there. All right. So in Romans chapter six, this is, I'm sorry to give you such a texty slide. I don't normally like to do that, but this is the entire reading from the epistle to the Romans that we read at a baptism service. And it's been pretty much a traditional epistle reading for baptisms in the East as, as long as I know. And so he, and it's probably one of the most thorough expressions of, of what the early church understands. And again, it's, it's typological in this, in the understanding type. When we use the term typological, it's, it's a specific type of symbolism in the sense that it's, you are, you are connecting into something else and participating. It's not just a, like, as we talked, I think last time about signs versus, you know, symbols and things like that. It is a participation in the original event. So St. Paul will say, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We entered into a special kind of relationship with Jesus Christ and participate in some way in his, not just his baptism in imitation, but his, in fact, his death in imitation. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So baptism is uh, not just the washing of water, it's really a, it's an act of burial. And that's why that immersion is such an important part, immersion, immersion that we talked about last time in terms of the right form. To go under the water is to be buried with him. To come back out of the water is to rise again with him. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So I think I mentioned this in parting last time, you know, the, that which that dies can never die again, right? From Game of Thrones. I mean, they, they took that from us, right? This is the principle that once you die to, in this life, sin is over. Now, of course, many people who are baptized find themselves sinning and sometimes sinning quite egregiously. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not that we are slaves anymore. If we do that, it's, it's our mistake. It's, uh, we're throwing ourselves back into chains, but we have been freed from sin through our baptism, and we enter into a new life through Christ, through baptism. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is, in a nutshell, what the understanding of baptism is. It's not just an outward sign of your personal confession. It's a typological participation in the death and resurrection of Christ. You are entering into a new life, in a meaningful way, it is not just a not just an outward expression of your good intentions. So, <clears throat> a little bit of uh, what's her name, Phoebe and Joey from Friends. I'm embarrassed that I know their names still, but <laughs> he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Faith only. Thank you, Joey. So, this is a little 
snippet from the from the part of the service. I just did a baptism uh, today, and we'll be doing one next week uh, at two o'clock. So I won't be teaching the three o'clock class, but I'll be uh, helping the bishop baptize one of our new believers. And before you baptize someone, we also pray over the waters of the baptism and make them sanctified waters. So it's not just, and I think we talked about this, you're supposed to use the running or living water. So how do you bless living water when the water you've blessed is downstream, right? But the whole point being the whole body of water has been changed, right? The whole, the yam and the nahar, the, the river and the sea. So this is part of the prayer. But do thou, O master of all, show this water to be, and this is such, this is why our prayers are so beautiful because talking about the development of doctrine, the prayers and the doctrine develop hand in hand because the, the prayers get more articulated as the reflection about what's happening becomes more deep. And so the prayers reflect that. So uh, early baptismal water prayers probably were pretty simple, maybe quoting something from the Psalms, but now they've kind of, this prayer that we have now is condensed all of these reflections from many centuries into this form, which is probably at least 1200 years old, if not older. Show this water to be the water of redemption, the water of sanctification, the purification of flesh and spirit, the loosing of bonds, the remission of sins, the illumination of the soul, the laver of regeneration, the renewal of the spirit, the gift of adoption to sonship, the garment of incorruption, the fountain of life. So you don't reduce baptism to one thing. It is a whole lot of things going on uh, that are all connected to each other, right? It's, it's, it's changing you. It is cleaning you. It is renewing you. It is also filling you, illuminating you. It is enlivening you. It is uh, all of these things all happening at once because that's, that's what happens when you come in contact with God's holiness. In the end, this is what's doing it. The water itself is still just water, but it is being infused by the presence of the Holy Spirit to become able to do all these things for us. In, uh, in the Greek, for example, we can find many different synonyms that are used when talking about baptism. Some you've already seen, anagnesis or anagenesis, regeneration, catharsis, cleansing, quiothesia, which is uh, literally uh, sun making. So adoption, you'll see that the adoption of sons language is part of that. Photismos, illumination, and neophytos, new planting. That's why we have neophytos fellowship tonight after Vespers for the new, newly planted. And proto anastasis, the first resurrection. Um, just as the, the fathers and the scriptures talk about the first death and the second death, right? The first death is the death of your body. The second death is kind of the eternal damnation that, the, that, that awaits the doomed. Uh, the, likewise, we also have the first resurrection, which is the resurrection of the soul. And then we have the second resurrection in the life of the age to come to the resurrection of life. There's another funny meme for you. <laughs> Baptism. Okay, so Father, based on the lectures by Father Josiah Trenum, uh, which I base my lectures on, he points out eight different things that baptism is as well. Baptism is first union with Christ, a new birth, remission of sins, entrance into the church, citizenship in the kingdom, covenant with God, indwelling of light, and invitation to cooperation with God. So that includes some of the things we've seen already, but some of the other things in the service that we haven't looked at. We're going to look now at each one of these individually. We sing at every baptism service. I mentioned this last Sunday that whenever you come to a liturgy where you hear us sing, as many of you have, as, has, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, that's a sign that that was a traditional day for baptisms. This from Galatians uh, is sung at every baptism because you are all sons of God through faith, faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we are entering, we are transcending whatever, um, you know, ident identities in the world that we might have and entering into a, a higher state when we are becoming one with Christ. St. John Chrysostom, late fourth century, speaks on his homily on Galatians. See what an insatiable soul. For having said, we are all made children of God through faith, St. Paul does not stop there, but tries to find something more exact, which may serve to convey a still closer oneness with Christ. Having said, ye have put on Christ, even this does not suffice him. But by way of penetrating more deeply into this union, he comments on it thus, ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That is, you have all one form and one mold, even Christ's. What can be more awful than these words? Uh, bad translation in the old times, awful meant awesome. What we would <laughs> now, yeah, fill, filling with awe. Uh, what could be more awesome than these words? He that was a Greek or Jew or a bondman yesterday carries about with him the form, not of an angel or archangel, but of the Lord of all. Yes, he displays in his own person the Christ. I mean, this is really incredible. This is saying somebody who was nobody in, in according to the world the day before, when he has become a Christian, has put on Christ, he has the form of God. There is a godliness now about him. This is something that emperors desired to have and claimed for themselves. And as many as they could bully into it, they could make them believe it, right? But <laughs> Christ does not come in that way. He shares his divinity by clothing us in the same and uniting himself to us. This is an absolutely beautiful image. Baptism is also a regeneration, a new birth, a new life. In John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, some of you may have, have encountered people asking, if you, asking you if you've been born again. <laughs> um, for Orthodox Christians, we, we, we believe that we are born-again Christians, 100% born-again Christians. That's what baptism is. That's what we understand it. And in fact, we would ask, were you born again without water? Because that's not what the Bible says. You have to have the water too. Uh, and unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So definitely, uh, you should... Orthodox Christians believe in being born again. Probably just a different understanding of what that means, uh, to keep it simple. Titus chapter 3, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Remember uh, from those who were here last week, we talked about how sacraments involve both the visible and the invisible, right? They are visible signs of invisible grace or the, in the, the visible cooperation of material things with the immaterial action of the Holy Spirit. This language is what you see here. It's not just the spirit. It's not just the water. It's both working in tandem by God's will and God's grace to accomplish this effect, which is real in the world and not just, you know, in our heads. St. Justin Martyr, another important figure that uh, the kind of the first apologist, I guess we could call him, is kind of the, a little bit late to call him an apostolic father, but some people probably would include him in that. He lived in the early second century and uh, defended the faith in Rome to his death as a martyr. We testify that the very baptism he announced is alone able to purify those who have repented. It is the water of life. The cisterns you have dug for yourselves are of no benefit to you. For what is the use of a baptism which cleanses the flesh and body alone? But here the assumption is the, the baptism cleanses more. It's more than just a physical washing. He also says this, as many as are persuaded and believe what we teach and say is true, 
and undertake to be able to live accordingly, are instructed to pray and in, to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past, and we praying and fasting with them. This, by the way, is the origin of Great Lent. The origin of Great Lent is that the, the catechumens who were preparing and being taught to enter the church would pray and fast before they did that. Uh, and at first it was maybe, you know, one day, three days a week. Eventually the church was saying, well, the strict fasting, yeah, maybe only a couple of days, but we'll keep a kind of a, a, a meat fast, a fast from blood for 40 days with the catechumens as they prepare themselves. And that way we'll also kind of regenerate and revivify our own baptism. It's kind of like a kickstart to your own spiritual life. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we ourselves regenerated. Not like Dr. Who, who regenerates very differently, um, but through the baptism of water. For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe and of our Savior Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. For Christ also said, unless you be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So this is his first apology, AD 156. Very, uh, again, as, I'll, as I mentioned last week, you know, high sacramental theology appears immediately in Christianity. It's not a development that is, comes because of um, the intrusion of paganism or co a compromise with paganism after Constantine. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite way around. That, that there's a, a more of a, f a willingness to move away from these, what are actually rather more Old testament -y ways of thinking uh, by the pagans later. So these are people who are dying rather than offering sacrifice to the emperor. They're not compromising Christianity for the sake of uh, pleasing the, the local authorities. Ambrose of Milan, who is a fourth century father, very important figure, uh, was kind of the in one of the great Latin fathers and was an influence on Augustine, uh, but doesn't get as much attention now as he should. Uh, talks about baptism as well. Who is the one who is born of the spirit and is made spirit? It is one who is renewed in the spirit of his mind. It is one who is regenerated by water and the Holy Spirit. We receive the hope of eternal life through the laver of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So this life in the Holy Spirit comes primarily through baptism. He also talks about Nahum and the Syrian. Uh, Nahum and the Syrian was a, was a guy in the Old Testament in the time of uh, Elijah and Elisha in that period where he had leprosy and he wanted to uh, be healed and the, the man of God sent him a letter and said just go dip into the river Jordan and God will heal you and he was at first miffed because he's like why do I have to go to the Jordan why can't there aren't there better rivers in Syria like you know the uh, what are the big rivers the Euphrates you know and the Tigris you know why do I have to go to this dinky because the Jordan's like a creek I mean, honestly, it's not a big, it's not a river is pretty generous most of the year. And of course, they, and his servant was wise and said, hey, if he asked you to do a, great, do a great epic and heroic feat, you would not have balked to do it. So why are you grieving about this simple little tiny thing? Go do the thing. And so he said, okay, fine. He went, he was healed. And that is remembered in the blessing of holy water, on Theophany. We read that as one of the, however many readings we do on that day. 13 readings, 14 readings, yeah. something like that. Uh, so he says, so that Syrian dipped himself seven times under the law, but you were baptized in the name of the Trinity. You confess the Father. Call to mind what you did. You confess the Son. You confess the Holy Spirit. Mark well the order of things in this faith. You died to the world and rose again to God. And as though buried to the world in that element, being dead to sin, you rose again to eternal life. Believe, therefore, that these waters are not void of power. So this is how the early church understood the power of baptism. Baptism is the remission of sins. This is always an interesting question, of course, because when you're an adult getting baptized, there's plenty of sins to, to, to have remitted. But, you know, the question is, what about infants? What sins do they have? You know, we, we pray for their remission of sins as well. Uh, obviously, they don't have sins of volition 
as children. They're, they don't have a, a will yet, really, you know, until maybe they're... The first sin I can remember committing is when I was about three or three years old, three to four years old. I remember that because I distinctly remember bonking a kid over the head with one of my toys and thinking, what's going to happen if I drop this thing on his head, you know? And, and when I gave my, my life confession, that was the first thing I said. The first yeah. time I ever sinned was this thing. That's the first moment I can remember ever having done something that I could feel guilty about. But an infant doesn't even have that, right? So what do we do with that? Well, let's take a look. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So the, the, the gift of baptism and the remission of sins is not, we, we don't isolate that to just necessarily individuals. But really, when, when people enter into the faith, it's an act of repentance, which is not just for your own distinct or discrete sins necessarily, but includes really your whole family, your whole life, you're blessing and sanctifying everyone in your household when you're baptized. And they can also join you in that baptism and participate in it as well. And that's what, uh, when they started baptizing, they were baptizing whole households of people. Um, that included the children. That included even bond servants, potentially, in many cases. And, and Father, um, wouldn't you say also that, that sin itself carries with it a taint, and that, that is, a, is something that is real and that does attach itself to us and to our surroundings. Yeah, That's we're born into, when you have a kind of more Old Testament viewpoint of these things, right, mm -hmm. instead of kind of a uh, abstracted moral theology, which comes later, kind of like a medieval theology, you know, sin is, it's just like, it's like a taint or a pollution or an infection, I like to use the term in like that because it's like it's like yeah we didn't have germ theory but they but they thought of sin as fulfilling that role you know some kind of sickness that leads to death anything that takes you apart from God or or, or closes you off from life had the quality of of sin to it so that's why in the Old Testament there's things you know that are that don't even seem like it's not like Somebody did something morally wrong, but they got they were tainted in somehow, and that needed atonement. That needed a washing through the through the sacrifices. What's the what's the language from Psalm fifty about? Uh, or in my mother, I, uh, my I was mother conceived in iniquities and sins. Did my mother I was conceived in iniquities yeah. and sins. My did my mother bear me? And this is really an interesting one because translations get wonky on this based on the theology. So like. If you look at the like Jerusalem Bible or New Jerusalem from the Roman Catholic tradition, they take the Latin, which is to the effect that I was a sinner from the moment of conception, which right. I think is sounds pretty Catholic. It sounds very Catholic, but it's it's problematic, right? Because how are you a sinner from the moment of con that feeds into that whole kind of original sin doctrine that they have problems with that developed into their whole immaculate conception theology and all these kind of things because. If you take that out and go back to a more original rendering and say in, in, in iniquities and in sins, and you understand it as this kind of in this state of pollution, yeah. in the state of fallenness and brokenness, I entered into this world. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's like one of the things we talked about in the, in the first group of lectures early on uh, when we had a le lesson on sin. It's like, Parents can only give to their children, you know, what they have. I can give biological life to my children, and I can give a broken, fallen state to my children because I am not perfected. Only God can give us something free from that sin, from that brokenness. And, of course, um, Orthodox Christians confess one baptism for the remission of sins, the word there in Greek, am amartyrion, is the, from the word that we get martyr. So it means I bear witness. So sometimes you see confess. Sometimes you see acknowledge. Confess is okay, but really it's like I bear witness. I testify. I am willing. I am being a martyr. That's what a martyr is, somebody who bears witness. So uh, it, 
to confess one baptism for the remission of sins. It's not like, yeah, I got baptized. You know, I did the thing. It's, it's really saying I am staking my life. I am, I am making that my testimony. I am putting my faith in Jesus Christ. It's just not an abstract point. It's not. It's, it's, it's an existential statement, really. And it needs to be treated with that kind of understanding of how important that is. Because what is, what is at stake? The promise of the Holy Spirit. The gift of life itself rests on that. And these creeds were baptismal creeds. As you remember, the first class from the first series of lectures is all about um, why do we even have creeds? Because this is the stuff that people needed to say and know to be baptized. This is what they were making that action be a testimony to. All right. The Shepherd of Hermas is an interesting document from the late first century. Uh, some people early on even thought that might be included in the, in the book of scripture, but because it was not directly kind of under the aegis of the apostles, um, it's kind of like one person removed or one relationship removed. It, it didn't get included, but it was included in what's called the apostolic fathers uh, because it was read by early Christians and considered to be a great value. Though some people didn't like it because they felt it was too lenient on sinners. So that's that's a that's a good problem to have, uh, I would say, from a Christian point of view. We have too many people that are too harsh on sinners. So uh, from the Shepherd of Hermas, chapter four, I have heard, sir, said I to the shepherd, from some teacher that there is no other repentance except that which took place when we went down into the water and obtained the remission of our former sins. He said to me, you have heard rightly, for so it is. This is why falling away after baptism was considered to be such a devastating loss. It was one thing to be kind of wishy-washy in the world, but still a pagan, right? But once you entered into this covenant relationship with God through baptism, and you entered into this newness of life, what repentance would there be for you? In fact, that's talked about in, uh, in St. Paul, you know, what repentance is there for someone who has tasted the heavenly gift and been filled with the Holy Spirit and experienced all the blessings, you know? And that's why apostasy is up there with adultery and murder as the highest of the worst things that can happen to you. Uh, now, the question is, is there any other repentance? Uh, the church had to figure that out. And that's where we'll talk about confession and penance and things like that. Because uh we, as long as a person is alive, we have hope that they can be received back, even if they fall, even if they've fallen terribly. So, but realize that falling from baptism was the kind of the biggest danger to Christians. And we're not talking about like venial type sins, right? We're talking about apostasy of faith, idolatry, giving into paganism, that those kind of things, offering sacrifices to idols, the things that you would, you know, they're holding the spear to your head and say, do this or we'll kill you. This is why uh, kings and emperors sometimes would not be. Yeah, so, baptized. yeah. Somebody asked me about St. Constantine, that he wasn't yeah. baptized till the end of his life. And I'm like, yeah, because he's got to be as, you know, still in that time, the emperor was still a guy who would might have to wield a sword. You know, he was a general and he would be responsible for life and death of many people. So, being in that position put him in a difficult position vis-a-vis -vis his baptism. How can you be a be a good Christian but still be in this position of overseeing the empire, which was still, in most respects, a pagan institution still? So he withheld being baptized until the end of his life uh, for that reason. So, yeah, of course, after that, over the centuries, it, you know, the, the empire becomes Christianized, starting with St. Theodosius in particular. Uh, and then they you know, have to come up with new ways of dealing with that issue. And you see canons developing for penance of soldiers, for example, that happen. St. Hippolytus of Rome, this is, this is um, uh, 
uh, probably third century stuff, uh, maybe early third century. Some of it has possible fourth century stuff, but this stuff is, is pretty core. Uh, he's describing the practice of liturgics in the early church as well in, in Rome, but it's drawn at that time, the East and the West are not so far divided. Rome's style of liturgy is still very much the same as what you would see in Egypt and Antioch. And it's because they're coming from there and bringing it to Rome for the most part. It's, it hasn't become its own kind of distinct thing. The children shall be baptized first. All of the children who can answer for themselves, let them answer. If there are any children who cannot answer for themselves, let their parents answer for them or someone else from their family. This is the origin of godparents. So godparents become sponsors for children. Uh, well, it's actually not the origin of all godparents because we see godparents serving for adults, but what we think of as godparents now. Uh, sp sponsors for adults are there from the beginning too. We see that in some of the interesting uh, early saints' lives. Uh, for example, um, Romana the deaconess, I think, is like the godmother for, I think it's, was it, maybe St. Polcari or so one of the, one of the prodigal women saints who kind of repented and came and, and, uh, and her, and she was baptized and they were all oh, good. You know, she's no longer a harlot and she's changed her way of life, but she still wanted to repent further. And she went off into a monastery where she, she pretended to be a eunuch. So she okay. went to a men's monastery and cross-dressed so that she would, she would be completely a different person. And this is, a, this, the holy transvestites of the early church. Um, we have some interesting characters. And Romano, the deaconess, was devastated because she thought her her goddaughter had gone back to prostitution and had law, you know. And only much later, when this uh, this prodigal saint was was on her deathbed, basically and dying of something, she revealed who she was and called yeah. her godmother and said, "I'm sorry, but I repented it." You know. It's, it's considered a heroic act of repentance, actually, that she did that. She completely denied who she had been to the point of basically uh, defeminizing herself and taking on a, 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 what would otherwise be a, a male lifestyle. It makes you wonder about the surprise of the washing the body. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was, <laughs> by that point, they knew. Yeah, she, revealed yeah. it, she revealed it before that. But don't you think, by the speaking of development, that happens, you know, that having somebody answer for the children who can't speak for themselves. But also then uh, when the church was growing and there were people who had apostatized under persecution and were coming back, I wonder if there's some influence on basically we need somebody to vouch for. Yeah, well, it's even before then. I mean, um, because them coming back, um, it becomes a huge controversy. In the, in the second and third centuries, uh, especially in between Rome and North Africa, there's, there's huge controversies doctrinally about that. Uh, but it's even before then, because part, when your faith is illegal, you wanna make sure that the person you're bringing in is legit. They're not, they're not an informer for, they're not a penetration, exactly. They're not trying to sneak in. So yeah, that, 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 was, that was part of that. But in this case, the, here we see already this, the role of godparents for children. And what you see is that this someone else from their family be eventually becomes someone else entirely. And in the Roman culture, particularly, there was the concept of, of the, the padron, the, the patron, right? And a patron became a, a, a fatherly figure uh, over somebody who was not necessarily his own flesh and blood, but became a benefactor, right? And so Godfather, in this sense, this role in society also was adopted by the church in the roles of godparents. And so when we have godparents, they kind of play that role. They are, they are like your sponsor, your patron, and so forth. And for children, they become like a second parent. And if that if that parent, that child's parents should pass away, for example, the godfather or mother then takes on that role because they're the they're the patronage role that they have. Okay, 
long, long bit on that a little bit. Afterward, when they have come up out of the water, they shall be anointed by the elder with the oil of thanksgiving. The bishop will then lay his hand upon them, invoking, saying, Lord God, you who have made these worthy of the removal of sins through the bath of regeneration, make them worthy to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Grant to them your grace so that they might serve you according to your will, for to you is the glory, the Father and the Son with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and throughout the ages of ages. Amen. So this is, this is talking about chrismation now, that the bishop would lay hands and they would be anointed after baptism. And in the, in the early church in the cities like Rome, uh, there were bishops plentiful nearby, right? You could find a bishop in the ancient church in m most cases because, you know, nowadays we have 50 bishops or something like that for the entire United States. And, you know, they're clustered in metropolitan areas. So like, what do you do if you, you know, you, you don't have a bishop nearby. But eventually, even that became difficult to have a bishop necessarily do that. And so bishops would bless the oil, which becomes the chrism, and give it in the east, uh, they would give it to the priest, and the priest would then anoint with the chrism on behalf of the bishop. In the west, you have the bishop still doing confirmations. So then confirmation eventually becomes difficult to do at the day of baptism. And then what happens? you have a bunch of people all come together for confirmation days and things like that. So that's kind of the development, why you see confirmation, I think, liturgically developing separate from, from baptism in the West. Um, that's my theory. That's my theory. I guess I, I could be uh, wrong, but um, in any case, it was originally combined together as one thing. And we'll talk next week more about the chrismation aspect of that. And Father, the baptism right, of course, there are two anointings. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about, I mean, obviously, the second one, which is being referenced here by all of us, is, is the chrismation. But before the baptism was. Well, it's baptism. hard to tell, actually, because this might be that other. Mm -hmm. There, There is a, definitely an anointing with regular oil that is involved in the baptism, either before or after in this early period. Either that later becomes like this oil of thanksgiving becomes the thing that we do before is not clear to me um, because there's a lot of interesting theories about like this gets into the holy unction thing. When we talk about holy unction, we'll talk about this. Father Victor Gordenchuk in, in Philadelphia just did his doctorate at Catholic U about this subject, uh, not about baptism, but about the history of holy unction. And a lot of the prayers of holy unction, especially the first priestly prayer of holy unction, is basically a baptismal oil prayer. And so there's definitely the idea of anointing oil being blessed was deeply connected with baptism from the very beginning. Um, and only later gets kind of parsed out. So it's a good question. It's not something I don't, I can't give you a great answer for today. But we, yes, normally we do baptize or anoint with oil before the baptism. And what's now explained or understood by that anointing is that that's the anointing of the Noahic covenant of, of Noah. So you're entering into, you're grafting into the kind of the line of Abraham. Uh, and, and instead of, you know, because you're not being circumcised yourself, you're, you're participating in the circumcision of Christ. We'll take a look at that in a minute through baptism. But you also are entering into even the covenant with Noah through that oil, because it's the olive oil. And that the, dove had the dove had in its beak. Yeah. Waters. So it's it's connecting you to the Old Testament right. timeline. So if you were a pagan coming into the church, you weren't coming in completely devoid of all that as well. You were step by step recapitulating the covenants of God through the Old Testament as well, becoming part of the part of Israel in the end. All right, 215 AD is the typical apostolic tradition date. St. Basil the Great, oh, come back, please. For prisoners, baptism is ransom, forgiveness of debts, the death of sin, regeneration of the soul, a resplendent garment, an unbreakable seal, a chariot to heaven, a royal protector, a gift of adoption. I don't think he means prisoners, just people in jail only. I think he means, you know, the prisoners of sin, the prisoners of the darkness of the world. Baptism is our ransom. It's our freedom. What is the purpose? What is the power of baptism? Through it, one being baptized 
changes in the mind, word, and deed, and by power given to him becomes the same as one who gave birth to him. This is what, when we, we hear about the kind of dis, distinct quality of orthodox teaching on salvation, you will hear the term theosis, which is a, basically godifying or deifying in Greek. So deification is not something that's unique to orthodoxy. You will find it in, in the entire Christian tradition. You will find it in the magisterial reformers pretty explicitly, but within the Eastern tradition, it has retained its central spot. And it's through language like this, St. Basil, the likeness of God that we're created to have that we lost because of sin is restored in all of this. So we become the same, not in essence, we don't become uncreated beings or divine beings by nature, but we do become by grace, those things. Baptism is entrance into the church and her faith. So this is from uh, first the story of the uh, Ethiopian eunuch who Philip the deacon meets. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, hey, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. So uh, why don't we do it this fast anymore? We sometimes do. <laughs> but for the most of the part, uh, we prefer to make sure people go through all of the process so that when they say these things, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And we, we actually have that. Do you believe in him? I believe in him as king and as God, right? That's actually part of the, the interrogation that our catechumen goes through before they go to baptism. You know, we ask them, have you joined yourself to Christ? Do you join yourself to Christ? Have you, you know, do you believe in him? I believe in him as king and as God. So that's still in the service. It's just, you know, we, we go through all the fullness of the steps. Uh, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, says St. Paul, we either Jews or Greeks, we either slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. We are all communicants of one another through baptism. When you are baptized into Christ, you are not baptized only into Christ. You are actually baptized into all that that encompasses, which is all the other believers. You become part of the whole family of God. So you don't, it's, it's not a vertical relationship, just you and God and no one else is involved. You suddenly, the walls blow out the sides of your individual subjectivity, and you discover the fullness of humanity awaiting you. St. Cyprian of Carthage says, Peter showed and vindicated the unity of the church by commanding and warning that we can be saved only through the baptism of the one church. So St. Cyprian of Carthage is one of these guys that we were talking about. What do you do when people fall away? Uh, um, in the third century, right? And, the, and so forth. Oh, I know, this, that's my favorite one. Just as in that baptism of the world by which the ancient iniquity was purged, the, the flood, okay, that's what he's talking about, the flood of Noah. The one who was not in the ark could not be saved through water. So now anyone who has not been baptized in the church cannot be saved, for the church has been founded in the unity of the Lord as the sacrament of the one ark. And Pretty powerful. The baptistries often had eight sides because the ancient thinking was that the ark was actually eight sided. Really, I didn't yes. know that. Yes, and, and even today, modern, uh, modern, more modern constructed baptistries sometimes only come on eight sides because it's you know it's also evocative. The eight days there were eight people, and it's cruciform. Like this is basically eight sided if yeah, you look yeah, at it. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's tying it together with the ark of our salvation, mm -hmm. which is the church. Nice. Uh, citizenship in the kingdom. Philippians St. Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So we are entering into the kingship of Christ and coming under 
bringing our lives and everything that we are into submission, subjection to him. Um, this, you know, when we talk about deification, deification is a, uh, is a twofold process in this life, that transformation begins in the soul and baptism is that rebirth of the soul. The resurrection is the rebirth of the body when even the body itself will be freed from corruption. So right now we're working on decorrupting our souls. And in the process, we help our bodies a lot because our bodies suffer a lot because of our sins, right? But first you purify your soul and your mind and your heart and so forth. In the resurrection of life, even the body itself will be transformed and become immortal, incorruptible, healthy, beautiful, I hope, <laughs> attractive and fit. <laughs> Probably, I'm guessing it will be, I'm hoping. So we all become naturalized citizens, but it's not like we're natural born. Correct. Yeah, exactly. It's an adoption, right? Yeah. Uh, and in Colossians, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, his, of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Think about you know, yourself as, a, as a, um, you know, a political asylum person, fleeing the iron curtain darkness of the world under the sway of the devil and being conveyed into citizenship in the land of freedom, the kingdom of heaven. The United States modeled itself on that inspiration and tries to be that. Um, the problem is somewhere along, they forgot that, that they're just the image, not the, not the reality. And by be, trying to think they were the reality, they've fallen farther and farther from it. But God help us. Uh, again, in the story of Noah, first Peter talks about this in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, a few, that is eight persons were saved through water, maybe part of that eightfold quality baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience. So that washing of the soul through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. So there is a change in the spiritual state of the world that takes place through the ascension of Christ, who is now enthroned at the right hand of the Father, and everything is being brought to be uh, under his dominion. And that's the role of the church, to, con to go out into the world and bring people into that kingdom and to bring them into that relationship. Um, and eventually, he'll come again and finish the job. But right now, we're, that's our job. Until that time, that's what we're doing. Ambrose of Milan again, the church was redeemed at the price of Christ's blood. Jew or Greek, it makes no difference. But if he is believed, he must circumcise himself from his sins in baptism so that he can be saved. For no one ascends into the kingdom of heaven except through the sacrament of baptism. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So circumcision uh, is fulfilled in our baptism. Um, there's that whole uh, episode on that subject in the Lord of Spirits podcast that I would recommend you listen to if you want to know more about it. But the, the too long didn't listen version is uh, when we are baptized into Christ, we are participating in his circumcision. So we don't have to be circumcised. What he is, everything that he is in fulfillment of the law is given to us, granted to us through grace. And that leads us to baptism as a covenant with God. So it's, it's one way is to say it is that circumcision is the sign of the old covenant, right? That's how you knew you were in covenant with God, is that the males of your people were circumcised. Now we don't circumcise them, we baptize them. But it's not to say baptism replaced circumcision as much as it is to say baptism encompasses circumcision plus a whole lot more. It encompasses all the covenant actions in one and brings a person into covenant with God through baptism. So Colossians, 
in Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So you are circumcised if you're baptized. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Uh, oops. Yeah, this is where we uh, had the problem, right? Yeah, because I... I uh, I edited this earlier and I screwed it up. You were circumcised by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses and wiped out the handwriting of the requirements, which is the next verse, which I didn't include, but it got typoed in there. Sorry about that. So again, it's a transition from death to life. We see this in uh, the, the incredible story of Zipporah and Moses, which they talk about in that Lord of Spirits podcast, that um, you know God was going to kill Moses for not doing what he wanted him to do. And Zipporah uh, steps into the situation and she circumcises um, the, the son, their son, and she, it says she flung it at or she touched Moses's feet with it and says, see, now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And this is the idea that somehow through that act of circumcision, she was uniting herself and her people into the covenant with Moses and, 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 and instructing him, you know, to be, to fulfill his commandment and covenant. And for some reason, God liked that. And God did not decide to kill Moses. And Moses decided, okay, I'll go to Egypt after all and do the thing, which of course, you know the story because you've seen Charlton Heston do it. Mm -hmm. But in the Nisabine hymn, which is a fourth century Syrian document of the early church, uh, they reflect on this weird story in Exodus chapter four. If Zipporah has circumcised her son with a temporal, temporal circumcision and has averted death, Will not death with much more reason be banished by the true baptism? The one baptism into Christ puts on the living one who vivifies the whole world. So by putting that the, the circumcised foreskin onto Moses, Zipporah saved his life. You have the circumcision of Christ put onto you through baptism that gives you true life. I mean, this is really bizarre, but awesome, you know, thinking. And uh, of course, even in the Old Testament, circumcision is understood on a deeper spiritual level. In Deuteronomy, uh, the Lord is, uh, commands the people, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your prophetic statements. Wash, therefore, and be, why does it say, am I not live streaming? Hmm. Okay, weird. Wash, therefore, and be now clean, and put away iniquity from your souls. As God bids you, be washed in this laver, and be circumcised with the true circumcision. So they, they again, did not think of, oh, you don't need to be circumcised, you just need to be baptized. Baptism itself was the true circumcision, because circumcision only affected a small part of you, right? The part of you that connected to your life-giving ability as a male. Baptism changes your entire being, right? It connects your whole body. So it's, it's a casting off of your entire flesh, burying it and bringing it back to life. It's also something women participate in as well. Instead of through their husband's body. Yeah, exactly. Before that, women could only be part of that covenant through their fathers or their uh, husbands, which became, which is part of one of the interesting, in our Wednesday night class, I've been talking about how to, how did Israel get constituted and reconstituted over time? And what do you do when you have a woman who's a pagan who wants to join? You know, there were ways of doing that, but she had to be somehow brought in under the protection of one of the tribes in some way. Even if she was not married or the daughter of one, she still had to be received somehow in connection with a tribe. So this is fulfilled in Christ. It's under his headship that all men and women are receiving that circumcision patronage. All right, Justin, there you go. The command of circumcision again, bidding them always circumcise the children on the eighth day was a type, a symbol of the true circumcision by which we are circumcised from deceit and iniquity through him who rose from the dead on the first day after the Sabbath, the eighth day. 
namely through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Sunday is the first day of the week, but it's also the eighth day, right? It's the day after the Sabbath. So it fulfills the type of the circumcision as well, and it becomes the life-giving act. Gregory the Theologian, the virtue of baptism is to be understood as a covenant with God for a second life and a pure conversation, a, a, a pure relationship. And indeed, all need to fear this very much and to watch our own souls and each one of us with all care that we do not become liars in respect of this profession. So it was, again, of the utmost significance. Number seven, we're almost there. Baptism is the indwelling of the light of the spirit. So this, the language of light is given. In fact, let me back up before you start reading this. After a person is baptized and they, uh, they go to put on their baptismal gown after coming out of the waters, the psalm, uh, I don't remember the number, the psalm is read, but it ends with, um, do not be like the, the, the mule who needs a bitter bridle to come close, you know be follow the way of the righteous and um but at the end of that the priest takes up the candle and lights the candle and gives it to the newly illumined person and says give me a robe of light O christ our god who clothes yourself with light as with a robe and so this is the understanding that the newly baptized person is illumined with the light of the spirit just so they're holding a candle to signify the the light of the spirit that is now filling them Ephesians chapter 5, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, Christ will give you light. Ephesians 3, 9, and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is which uh, in which for the ages has been hidden God who created all things. So we are being enlightened. The uh, Obviously, the term enlightenment got co-opted in the West in the 18th century, early, late 17th, early 18th century by the Enlightenment the Enlightenment was far from what we would consider a Christian Enlightenment. It was definitely a neo-pagan return to Gnosticism <laughs> for the most part. I mean, I'm sure there was many edifying aspects of it, and I do love to read Voltaire, but uh, uh, ironically, <laughs> he, was, he was worried for a second. <laughs> I like him because he's, he's a snarky French guy, and they're fun. Um, the, church, the church calls baptism photismos, illumination, and refers to the baptisans. It's another word you never use outside of church. The baptisans as the illuminans. So once you have been baptized, you are an illuminant. You are the true illuminati. You are the true Illuminati, and you didn't have to uh, join a secret society to do it. Just a martyr again. There's no other way than this, to become acquainted with Christ, to be washed in the fountain spoken of Isaiah for the remission of sins, and for the rest, to live sinless lives. Sounds so easy when they said it like that. Yeah, sure. that's all there is. Yeah. So and so he says, this is why the name of God, the Father and Lord of the whole universe, is pronounced in the water over anyone who chooses to be born again and who has repented of his sins. The person, and by the way, uh, you know, we don't baptize just in the name of Jesus. It's always the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit three times. The person who leads the candidate for baptism to the font calls upon God by this name alone, for God so far surpasses our powers of description that no one can really give a name to him. Anyone who dares to say that he can must be hopelessly insane. This baptism is called illumination because of the mental enlightenment that is experienced by those who learn these things. The person receiving this enlightenment is also baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, who through the prophets foretold everything concerning Jesus. So there is a threefold baptism, not once in the name, but three times. And that's 155.80. Clement of Alexandria, another important figure from that um, uh, mid to late second century. When we are baptized, we are enlightened. Being enlightened, we are adopted as sons. Adopted as sons, we are made perfect. Made perfect, we become immortal and sons of the Most High. Uh, this is actually, you know, it's not all at once. That's one thing you just I want to be clear about. I don't think he's saying that this all happens immediately, but rather that this is the, the stages of, of 
uh, the, the typical way of understanding is purification, illumination, and deification. So through the baptism, you're then illumined. And being illumined, you grow in becoming what you were created to be, you perfected. For the Orthodox understanding, the Father's understanding, perfection is something that actually takes eternity. Because perfection means becoming more like God. And God is not, cannot be measured or ended or limited. So our deification process begins in this life, but continues through eternity. And we will be as, as uh, to, you know, referencing St. Paul, going from glory to glory, ascending the heights. This work is variously called grace, illumination, perfection, and washing. It is a washing by which we are cleansed of sins, a gift of grace by which the punishments do our sins are remitted, and illumination by which we behold that holy light of salvation. This is in Pedagogus, the instructor, uh, late second century. Great work of Clement of Alexandria. Lastly, baptism invites the co cooperation of our free will. I did a baptism today with a two-year-old. Two-year-olds have their own free will. I was baptized when I was uh, about two years old, and I remember aspects of my own baptism. I remember that I was definitely not willing. <laughs> or I didn't enjoy it at the time. Let me put it that way. I probably went along with it eventually, but I was like all two-year-olds, quite feisty about being put into those waters. Uh, this little tyke here looks pretty feisty as well. James says, do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? So we talked about this in our previous class um, about the relationship of faith and works. But baptism should be understood. It's a mystery of grace, but it's not magic. Baptism invites our cooperation or in Greek synergia because we are being transformed into that same image of the Lord from glory to glory, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Um, Sometimes little kids, they're not willing at the time. Certainly infants don't have the, the if they could choose, they'd probably say, I don't want to go in there because they cry a lot about it. But eventually the grace grows within them. Uh, St. Gregory Palamas warns us though, baptism alone is not sufficient. Again, it's not magic, right? So it needs our growth, our continuing cooperation as we go forward. If we choose to live sinfully, Holy baptism and the divine sacraments that follow it will not save us from eternal condemnation, but we will lose the heaven, heavenly inheritance just as the Israelites lost the promised land with our impenitent behavior and disobedience to God's commandments. You know, and, and this is why th like the emperors might not want to be baptized until the end because they know they're going to have to do some dark deeds as rulers, right? They know that they wield the power of the sword. They may have to commit war. They may have to execute people, things like that. Uh, and, and that was, you know, something that was not so far limited from them like it is today, where you can, you know, you sign a paper, you pick up a phone, and you don't really have to deal with the ramifications. Back then, you had to hold the sword yourself. Uh, maybe that was more civilized, honestly. But uh, so it is a danger, you know, and sometimes if the fact that we have received this great gift of baptism in, in some respects, there is a greater responsibility on us. And so we need to take it extra seriously. If we're not, if we don't intend to change our ways, if we, if we, uh, if we don't really have the desire to follow the Lord's commandments, why are we, why are we going in those waters? Why are we saying those words? Why are we participating in those sacraments? So that's, it on a nice happy note that's the end of our class for today but uh any questions from anybody about any that we've talked i know i went really this was the fire hose uh, uh, that i warned you about last week uh, just a lot of different information but as you see a lot of it probably very redundant <laughs> a lot of it saying the same thing in, in different ways but i just wanted you to see kind of a full perspective from the early church fathers how they understood baptism, what they, how serious they took it, how they understood how powerful and meaningful it was, and, and to understand that in the Orthodox Church, we still think of it these ways. This is how we approach it. 
It's not a, it's not something we do. That's just cute. And nice. We do it for good luck for our kids. Hope they get a good job and don't have any problems in life. We're, we're, we, we pray in the baptism service. There's a great, my favorite prayer is um, in the original. I think I mentioned last week that there's the prayers that were done eight days after a person was baptized usually. And those were prayers for victory. And in it, it says, we pray for this person to have victory over the enemies that viciously attack us all. We are recognizing that once you've been baptized and chrismated, you are going off to war and you are going to have a fight. Um, we talked about this in our Friday book study as well. Like, you know, anybody who desires to build faith is going to be faced with trials and temptations and difficulties. It's, you know, and there are plenty of people in the world who don't have a difficult time, but, um, you know, if they desire to grow in faith, they're gonna, <laughs> I don't think there's a way around it. So this is here to prepare you, to arm you, to armor you and to equip you going forward.